Weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're live. Don't say anything gross. Excuse me. I'm going to sneak by you. I really apologize. I am I am I so there are many people in here that I do not recognize. How many of you took GR already? All right, see those hands that are up around you? Those are the people who have taken one of these courses before. If you're kind of wondering what it's going to be like, ask them. They have a good idea of what you're in for. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, Zach, you want to stand up and introduce yourself to the class? <laughs> <laughs> Zach is your TA. TA. And he's also Woo! a master's student. And he's going to be grading and probably holding some homework help hours for you. And he'll contact you all to try to organize those at a time that is best for you. Cool. Um, if you don't know me, I am. Oh man, Zach, you're fired. This marker sucks. <laughs> I, uh, I am Flournoy, also known as Dr. Flournoy, also known as Professor Flournoy. Never Mr. Flournoy, that's my dad. Uh, but you can just call me Alex. So just call me Alex, don't call me Flournoy. Most people pronounce it wrong anyway. So, um. Anyway, so this course is going to be a lot of fun. And we're going to record all the all the lectures and then put them on YouTube. I'll link them from the course website so that you can uh, review things. Um, you could actually watch the entire course already on YouTube because last time I thought it was posted. But anyway, um, so I was very happy that at least as far as the people that are enrolled, I have pictures of all of you. And those who took GR know what's going to happen. I'm going to make a little deck of cards out of all of your faces. And then as I teach, uh, I'll just randomly select cards in that deck and ask people questions just to do all of the games. Um, so it's sort of a low level of active engagement. Um, was it too terrible, was it? No. No, no. It wasn't terrible. Terrible. Wow. And then I got to the point where I laid them all out, and then I actually, instead of randomly picking them, I picked the people I liked the least. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a book, um, if you haven't, are any of you related to uh, David Griffiths? No. Tell us the video. How do we do that? Just, there's a, there's a round button. <laughs> 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 okay. Is it recording, Ariel? <laughs> They have different approaches to this, but, but there's one that's called it's called the, is it the, the pigeonhole theory or the mailbox theory. Okay. But anyway, the idea is um, if you read this little paragraph, you're going to see a lot of words and, and some ideas, and you're not going to know what they are because you haven't learned it yet. But you will have seen it, and you will have said, oh, wait a minute, I wonder what that is. And then when you come into the room, instead of being a completely blank slate and then trying to absorb all this information, you've actually got sort of a framework, and now you're just filling in the little slots. Oh, OK, so he said we're going to talk about the Dirac equation. And then you come into the room, and we talk about the Dirac equation. OK, so it's really, really short, really painless, but please do it. Um, I'm going to take the time to write them. You can take the time to read them. And it's literally a paragraph, so it's nothing, it's nothing painful. Uh, the layout of the course, I should probably look at the layout of the course. What was the layout of the course? You're going to do reading quizzes. Or not reading quizzes, you're going to do homework quizzes. Uh, did, did everybody look at the syllabus? Has anybody not looked at the, or sorry, the course webpage? You have not looked at it? Okay, well, if, if you took GR, you kind of know how the course is going to run. If you haven't looked at the course webpage, uh, go to the physics department website, navigate to my page, and then find your way to this course webpage, which is linked off my personal website, I think. But anyway, so I'm going to give you weekly homework assignments. They're going to be uh, due on Tuesdays. And when I say due, what I mean is I'm not going to collect them and they're not going to be graded. But rather, on Tuesdays, we're going to start class with a 15 minute homework quiz. And the homework quiz is usually going to be a front and back, maybe one question on each side, maybe two questions on each side. But anyway, you only have to do one of the two. 
And the idea is that if you did the homework, and you can certainly bring in your homework to reference if you want, if you did the homework, you should be able to do the quiz. You should be able to do the quiz in principle in 15 minutes. If you didn't do the homework, there's no way. Um, so that's kind of the idea. The benefits to this is that Zach can grade these really quickly, and then you can get your grade back really quickly. Um, you don't have to give up your homework for like three weeks while some slow ass TA grades it. <laughs> but the other thing is, is it really doesn't do you any good to copy somebody's homework. Um, not that any of you would ever, ever do that. Um, Wow, I expected at least one laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you're all guilty. <laughs> anyway, uh, but there's no benefit in copying somebody's homework because, like, you have to sort of how to process the material in order to do the quiz, okay? Because it's not just repeat a homework problem; it's actually, you know, using the material that you covered up homework. So those are going to be the start of class on Tuesday. So it's very important that you be here on time. Um, for those, uh, for us to get that uh, taken care of. I won't delay the start of those because every lecture section is gonna be packed. And then uh, I'm gonna do something a little bit different this time. Um, I'm not gonna do oral exams, which I've done the last couple of iterations of ER particle. Rather what I'm gonna do is an in-class midterm. So I'll kind of talk to you about how the class, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Um, uh, it's it's basically basically the idea is to kind of get at the same assessment that I did with the orals. So that, you know when you if you took jar and you went through the orals, kind of think of how bad that experience was. It's going to be something like that. I'm not expecting you know to that cram and reproduce some like all this material on an hour and 15 minute exam or anything like that. It won't be any, anything too taxing. But um, there's a natural breaking point in the course where and I'll, I'll go over the structure of the course in a few minutes where. We kind of get done with a big chunk, and that's a good place to assess, and then we'll move into the sort of end of the course. Uh, so we'll have an in-class uh, midterm, and then a take-home final. And so those will be all the sort of deliverables from the, for the duration of the course. Okay. Um, any questions about any of those details before we get into the good stuff? It is hot in this room. God yes. almighty. <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, okay, well, here we go. Oh, yeah, my office hours um, have not yet been set, uh, but most likely um, I will hold some late office hours on Mondays because I know that you all do the very responsible thing and wait until Monday night to do the homework. Yeah. Do the homework. Um, and just accepting the reality of who you are. Uh, so I'll probably hold some late office hours on Monday, probably something from like five to seven, um, or if, if not a little bit longer. Um, and I'll post those as soon as I get them sorted out. And then of course the rest of the office hours will be sprinkled throughout the week. Um, and your first homework assignment is not going to be due this coming Monday, obviously, because we're, or sorry, this coming Tuesday. Uh, it's not going to be this coming Tuesday because we're only going to have this one class. Um, but it'll be due the following Tuesday. And for those of you who aren't aware, you should all be aware we do not meet this Thursday. This is Thursday is technically a Monday. And I'll let the people who watch this online figure out what the hell that means. <laughs> but Thursday's a Monday. Wednesday's a Wednesday, which is good. Friday's a Friday. Thursday's a Monday. We don't meet on Monday, so we don't meet on Thursday. We wait until next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Yes, Whoever wants right. this is so <laughs> I know. I know. Um, okay. So now I'm going to get into it. Um, Zach, you can leave if you want, or you can stay around. And be like, <laughs> 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 um, Wolfgang, where's Wolfgang and Will? <laughs> so Wolfgang and Will are my senior design students, and I can't really say they've got a lot of insight into this course. <laughs> <laughs> they know a lot more about GR than the GR students came out of the class knowing because they've been working with it a lot since then, but, um, but they're going to be particularly interested in the content of this course because they've been working on gauge theory for like six months not knowing what gauge theory is. Yeah, so we can learn what gauge theory is in particle physics. Finally. Okay, so um, I hate this black marker. It sucks. I mean, all right, so this course, uh, I don't know actually what this course is called. Does anybody know what this course is called? Particle physics. Particle physics. physics? No, 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 the name of the course. Oh, particle physics? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> so this course is called particle physics. <laughs> You'll understand why I was confused in a minute. And it's called particle physics partly because, um, you know, I picked a book called Introduction to Elementary Particles. And so it made sense to call this course particle physics. And I think many of you come into the course thinking, oh, you know, particles, we break stuff into little bitty bits, and those little bitty bits are what we call particles. Um, you know, we don't so much call an atom a particle, 
because we really know what atoms made of stuff. But a lot of us are pretty comfortable calling an electron a particle. Some of us, some of us are comfortable calling a proton a particle, but some of us are not. But anyway, <laughs> I ended up just thinking, oh, we're going to talk about the little things that everything's about. Um, but this is actually just incredibly misleading because we're not going to talk about particles in this class at all. Okay, one of the very first things we're going to learn is that a particle description is woefully inadequate if you want to do physics at the fundamental level. Okay, so I actually have a name for this course, um, and I'll just write up the title of the real title of this course. So this is the fake title, fake news. <laughs> the real title of this course is what I call um, Physics at the Fundamental Level Fundamental Frontiers. Don't write that down. Um, oh, P.S. Uh, I will be posting all of my lecture notes uh, on the course website in addition to linking the video. So you really don't have to write anything unless you want to. Physics at the Fundamental Frontiers with <coughs> which we are currently content. <laughs> So that's the title of this course, uh, for reals. So, so we're really going to talk about um, physics at its, at its deepest level that we are completely confident of. Now, there are deeper, deeper levels, okay, and, and we'll get some hints at that uh, in the course of this, of this class and, you know, maybe just through some anecdotal conversations. Um, the idea of string theory is a level deeper than even this, but, um, and there are other avenues. Uh, but what I mean by this is the, the content that we're going to talk about in this course um, is, first of all, correct. The standard model of particle physics is incredibly well tested. It's extremely accurate. We have full confidence in it, except for some of the puzzles that it, it, it presents uh, to us that still have to be addressed. But, um, but it, is, it is like very, it's got a standing on a very solid foundation, and it's sort of it's the deepest level thing that we have that much confidence in. Okay, string theory is deeper, but we don't have that much confidence in string theory. Okay, chemistry is not nearly as deep. We have a lot of confidence in chemistry, but it's not as deep. Okay, so this is about as deep as you can go, um, and not have people in other branches of physics laugh at you for working in it. I enjoyed studying string theory for many years. Okay, so um, so. So I'll, I'll explain, you know, if we're going to get rid of the idea of particles, what is it that we're going to deal with? But I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but what I want to do first, and I find this to be a very useful exercise for you at this point, um, this is where I would have sent Zach for a new eraser. But I guess one of those two. Maybe this one's a little bit better. Um, anyway, okay, so I find the following exercise to be very useful for you at this point in your Give it a shot. <laughs> I realized there was no way I was going to try and catch it because I would probably catch it inside out. So I'm just going to watch that video. Okay. I was always a better catcher than thrower. <laughs> Okay, so what I want to do is, is kind of give you some very sort of high level language in which we can sort of frame what we're doing and the kinds of things we're talking about. And what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes is really applicable to everything you've done in physics. Um, so when we do physics, there's a couple of different levels at which we can address things. And I'm going to start with the idea, there's that marker, of what we might call a framework. And when we refer to a framework in physics, what we often have in mind, to put a more familiar word in it, is some type of mechanics. And a um, mechanics is very generically, um, you all have an idea of what the word framework means, right? You know, it's just kind of a skeletal thing and you put lots of interesting stuff into it. So I'm going to use the word framework in the definition of framework. Um, a framework for describing the evolution of a system ok 
Okay, and I'm going to talk about various examples of what I mean by a framework or type of mechanics. Um, and then, to contrast with that, we have what we might call a theory. And when we refer to a theory, what we're talking about is when we take a particular framework, so we choose what framework we want to work in, and we apply it to a particular context. And then the last on this totem pole, but not least, is what we might call a model. And a model is an effective theory uh, that requires um, inputs. And I always have a, just so you're aware, I have a transition whenever I start teaching these classes. I come away from teaching physics one where everything's PowerPoint and then I'm lecturing in a class where everything is on the board. So I might be writing more than anything to the first few lectures, but I will adjust in time. Um, that requires some inputs that are not predicted. Uh, by the theory itself. But are selected to match the right behavior. Bang, match. Desired behavior, i.e., agree with experiment. Okay. So, um, disclaimer: not everybody in the world agrees with this language. This is just some, this is just a way that I find it convenient to sort of categorize what we do in physics. You can talk to somebody in our physics department, and they might have a different set of ideas. You might talk to somebody in a different department on campus, they might have a different set of ideas. Um, but this is just, for me, a nice way to sort of organize what we, what we deal with. Okay, so now, class exercise. I want you to talk to the people around you, and I want you to come up with an example of a framework, an example of a theory, and an example of a model. <coughs> introduce yourself. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. These words can appear, but they don't necessarily follow sort of this definition. And you'll really appreciate why quantum field theory is not a theory in this sense in, in a few moments. Um, Just afraid. So, uh, no, no takers for theory. Principle of least action. Um, that's actually sort of the one of the primary axioms of a framework. So, classical classical uh, Lagrangian dynamics. Be precise, but um, density functional theory. 
Density functional theory is <laughs> it's, it's actually more like this. <laughs> okay, all right. It's good. definitely it's a density cool. theory. Okay, so it turns out, it turns out that in the, in the nomenclature I'm using, there's actually very few theories. Oh, okay. So string theory is a theory, um, and also pure QCD is a theory. Because it turns out that most of the things that we actually work with in physics are models. Um, so, for example, much of this class is going to be devoted to exploring the standard model of particle physics. Now, a model is an, a theory in a sense, but it's important to realize that it is not a pure theory, it's what's called an effective theory. And one of the key ideas of a model as opposed to a pure theory is that the, a model has inputs. It has parameters in the description that you have to go out and actually experimentally measure. They are inputs that you can't get from the mathematical consistency itself. String theory is not like that. String theory has no no experimental inputs. You literally just look at the mathematical consistency and it predicts everything, including the dimension of space-time. When we do particle physics and we work with the standard model, we start out by saying space-time is four-dimensional. We start out by saying the electron has this mass. Okay, those are inputs. So the standard model is a model in much of what you do in physics is working with some kind of model. Working with frameworks in and of themselves is not very useful, okay, because you want to study something. These aren't things. These are ways of describing things. So you, you want to study a particular physical system, so you're really usually working with models, okay? And density functional theory is actually an example of a model. Yeah. Where would Maxwell's equations fit in? So Maxwell's equations... Because you can get those from the conserved quantities of QED, right? So, Mac, well, let, so, um, QCD. so let's be really careful. <laughs> so you just said Maxwell's equations and then you said QED. Yeah. So when we want to talk about Maxwell's equations in the context of a classical theory of electromagnetism, then that's separate from QED because QED is the quantum theory of electrodynamics. So if we just want to relegate ourselves to classical electromagnetism, then pure electromagnetism, in the sense that you don't talk about electrons, because as soon as you talk about electrons, you have to say what the mass is. But if you talk about pure electromagnetism, where you just have E and B fields interacting, that theory is, in some sense, a pure theory, because there's no mass that you have to input, because the photon is massless. Okay? It's not a very interesting theory to study, because if you take away charged particles, electromagnetism is a little bit boring because you can't get anything to do anything. You can't even get waves. You can't even get light because you've got to have a source to get light. We know that light can propagate outside of the presence of charged particles, like through empty space, but something's got to get going. Now, that's going to be very different in QCD, quantum chromodynamics, because in that case, the force particles actually play with each other. And so they do some interesting things that you don't see in, in, uh, in the case of electrodynamics. But anyway, that, that's kind of jumping ahead. And, and at the end of the course, you'll certainly have a firm understanding of why that's the case. Um, OK, so, so what I'm going to do to start with is I'm going to review a couple of frameworks in which we operate in physics. Okay? You'll be very familiar with most of these. And then we'll kind of end this part of the discussion on well, what framework are we going to have to use to do particle physics? Because we've got to start by, with the right framework. And then we can turn to, OK, what's the rest of the model that we're going to be studying? So let's actually look at a couple of different frameworks that you've looked at in your explorations through physics. And um, most of these can kind of be related through um, what you've probably heard of as correspondence principles. So let's start perhaps with the one that you would have seen the earliest. Um, <coughs> So uh, one framework which you were introduced to as early as physics one, um, or perhaps in the womb, I don't know when you started to <laughs> uh, but there's non-relativistic or Newtonian mechanics. And then um, we can uh, take this framework, and I'll, well actually let's just talk about some of the, um, some of the, realms in which this is actually a useful uh, way to do physics. So first of all, I'm going to be very general when I talk about Newtonian mechanics. So this can include Lagrangian descriptions based on the uh, principle of least action. If you like, you can use Hamiltonian mechanics. The general idea that I have in mind here, though, is that this kind of, of a mechanics framework is useful for low speeds. Okay. 
And it is based um, on a model of space-time, which is actually a very weird model if you think about it, um, compared to uh, relativistic mechanics. Um, but it's a model of uh, three-dimensional space uh, and an absolute time direction, um, which for you all, like that's the context in which you're used to doing physics. But when you do relativistic physics, it turns out this is actually really weird. The way relativ relativity treats time is so much more natural. Um, and in the Newtonian uh, case, um, we have a principle of relativity that we work with, and I'm going to write this down just to contrast it with uh, other forms of relativity, uh, called Galilean relativity. And so just to write down what, what I mean by Galilean relativity, let's just set up a little uh, context in which to make some sort of relativistic or some sort of relative. A comparison. So I'm going to talk about a frame S. So I've got some coordinates and they're describing the, uh, or they're the coordinates used by an observer in some inertial frame S. And then I'm going to have another inertial frame. I'm going to call it S prime. And uh, the inertial frame S prime is going to be moving with respect to S along this direction with some velocity U. Okay. And then in the frame S prime, so now you're a little person standing in this frame. So you're observer S prime. This is observer S. He's riding the rocket ship with S prime. He looks at a particle here and notices, hey, wait, that guy's moving with a velocity V prime. And we can ask a very simple question, which is, well, if this guy sees this particle moving with a velocity V prime, what velocity would this lady see? Prime minus U. Yeah, so this is going to be, so we could call it V, and V is essentially going to be U plus V prime. Okay, that's the statement of Galilean relativity. Okay, so this person would observe that particle moving with a speed V, where the, where the speed observed by this guy, or this lady, is this speed plus this speed. And I mean, these, these are velocities, and they've got traditional like, fancy stuff, but we're not gonna worry about it, okay? So, you know, this is kind of a fan, uh, fancy schmancy hoity toity thing, but this is really simple. Like, you know, if I'm riding in a car that's going 60 miles an hour, and you're standing on the road, and I toss a beer from the back seat to the person front seat at three meters per second, can you see that beer moving at 60 miles an hour plus three meters per second? So, I don't know what that is. That's what you can see, right? That's what we're talking about. Okay, this is it's not abstract. This is literally very important applied results for beers being thrown in cars. Not that anyone in the front seat is getting a beer. Okay, so um, so here this is as seen in S, and this is as seen in S prime. Okay. We're not going to be doing lots of things like this in this course, so if this is not entirely comfortable with you, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to contrast this framework with a uh, more general framework, and that framework we might call relativistic mechanics. <coughs> and relativistic, me relativistic mechanics is essentially uh, built on the foundation of the principle of special relativity. Okay, it's funny, a lot of people walk around talking about the theory of special relativity. It is a framework for doing physics, it's a mechanics, it's relativistic mechanics. And in contrast to Newtonian mechanics, relativistic mechanics is valid when? All speeds. Exactly. People carry around the notion that relativity is important for fast speeds. Relativity is always true for fast speeds and slow speeds. You can do relativity on me, nice. even though I'm moving very slowly, okay? And you'll get the right answers. It's just that you're going to do more work than you really need to. You could have done something a little bit simpler. This is generally simpler to work with. And you would get approximately the same answer if it's at low speeds. Of course, if it's at high speeds, this is going to give you a wildly wrong answer, okay? So this is valid for any speed. And by the way, when I use the word speed, we should make we should be clear. This could be the speed at which a particle is moving, 
but it could also just be the relative speed of two observers' frames. Okay. Um, the model of space-time and relativity is actually much simpler than the model in Galilean relativity. It's just based on a unified three plus one dimensional space-time. And there's a really beautiful geometry that underlies that. Um, you can take general relativity if you want to kind of learn a little bit. The meat of that. And um, in terms of the relativity principle, and this is just one part of Galilean relativity. There's lots of other things you could write down. But I'm just going to write down sort of the corresponding thing in special relativity. In special relativity, if I set up this same little analysis, you know, an observer in S prime, see the thing moving with V prime, this frame is moving with a velocity U relative to this one, what does this person see? The answer, as you're all aware, for modern physics is decidedly different. It looks something like this. Two very, very important observations that you should have seen at some point in your education. And I'm going to allow you to take a moment to work them out for yourself. But I want you to use that formula and prove the following two things. One, I want you to prove that if all of the speeds involved are really small, it reduces to this. Secondly, I want you to prove that it demonstrates that the speed of light is the same to all observers. So do that. And you go work with your neighbor if you want. So two things, you want to show that it, for all the speeds being small, that gives rise to, reduces to this. And if something is moving with the speed c for one observer, it's also moving with the speed c for the other observer. Well, the dimensions cancel, but the um, True. bottom becomes 1 plus 1, and the top is 2c. Just get c. Then you just plug that into this expression and you'll discover that V is also C. Okay? And that's just a step of algebra. All right? So, so these are two frameworks for doing physics. 
And to give you an idea of what I mean by a framework in contrast to a theory is at no point in talking about these two frameworks have I said what it is you're studying. I haven't said what particle you're studying, what force you're dealing with. I haven't said that you're going to talk about an electron and the electromagnetic force. I haven't talked about whether you're going to talk about a planet and a gravitational force. So I can define these frameworks, these mechanics, before I've even given you what you're going to apply them to. Of course, if you take a framework and you apply it to a particular set of particles and forces, then you're actually working with a model or possibly even a theory, okay? Um, which poses an interesting question. What about general relativity? Where does it sit in the scheme of things? Is it a framework? Uh, no. Who said no? Why? It's just a relativistic version of gravity. It's not like a... Exactly. You would not appreciate this unless you study general relativity. A lot of people think general relativity is a generalization of special relativity, and that's exactly wrong. General relativity is a relativistic generalization of Newtonian gravity, but that's a specific force. So that's actually generalizing a theory or a model. So general relativity is more akin to a theory or model than it is a framework for doing physics. Um, all the things can get a little muddled the deeper you get into that. Okay, so we can ask ourselves, if we were to do particle physics, which of these two is more important? Well, you know, we can first of all ask ourselves, are things going to be fast? You know, when you build a particle accelerator and you smash things together, are they going to be moving fast? And uh, we're going to routinely encounter speeds on the order of... I need my glasses. 0.9999999 9C. <laughs> Thank you. Which, just to give you context, is about 7 miles per hour less than C. I think that's much more useful. Um, but anyway, uh, so when we, if we want to have a description of things happening in particle accelerators where they're moving this fast, clearly uh, this is not going to suffice. So we're going to need this. But more importantly than that, <coughs> why would we try and formulate a, a fundamental description of things in terms of a limited description? Like We should really be looking at something that's always true if we want to get to the fundamental frontiers of, of physics. Okay. So even if we were only describing slow particles, to be completely as accurate as we can be in all possible scenarios, we should really be looking at relativistic mechanics, not in or non relativistic mechanics. Okay, so what do you think comes next in our discussion of mechanics? Quantum. Yeah, exactly. I heard somebody say in the back, but quantum. Okay, so now what we're going to talk about is again starting with non relativistic Newtonian mechanics, but this time our generalization is going to go to quantum mechanics. And by the way, <coughs> I should say, um, <coughs> When you go from special relativistic physics to non or to Newtonian physics, um, that's actually a very smooth transition. Uh, it's it's a much different beast when you talk about quantum for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but generally speaking, when you work with special relativity, in a sense, you just kind of replace the equations. Like you have that velocity addition equation, you just have a new velocity addition equation. You know, you talk about the length of something which never changes. Now you got the length of something that can change, but you know, there's still a well-defined notion of length, and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a pretty smooth transition from relativistic to non-relativistic mechanics. It's going to be different in the discussion of quantum. Okay, so a couple of points about non-relativistic mechanics um, or Newtonian mechanics, uh, which are good for comparison with quantum, is that this is valid for large decoherent systems. Okay. Now that might seem like kind of a funny thing, large decoherent systems, but we're actually living in an era where we have to be a little bit more precise with our language. So a long time ago, it used to suffice to say uh, Newtonian mechanics is useful for large systems. You know, to really see quantum mechanics, you have to go to really small systems like the size of an atom. That's where quantum mechanics becomes kind of important these days. But nowadays, that's not necessarily the case because of the existence of 
Condensates. Condensates, exactly. So, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years, we've been able to manufacture quantum condensates, which are very large quantum mechanical systems. So it's no longer sufficient to say, this is a valid description for large systems. They have to be large and they have to be decoherent. And that's where you rule out condensates because condensates are a coherent, a large macroscopic but quantum mechanically coherent system. And that kind of thing you cannot describe with Newtonian mechanics. Okay, but for most, for most practical uh, ways of thinking, you can just think, you know, large things you can describe classically. Like you, you can describe classically. Okay. Um, now, an important point for contrasting with quantum is that when you do Newtonian mechanics, it's a deterministic framework. So what I have in mind here is if I give you initial conditions, bless you, uh, initial conditions, and the dynamics. So what I have in mind here is the forces that are governing how things evolve. Um, the solution to the equations of motion, which this generates, uh, the solutions uh, predict unique evolution of the system. Okay, and I write all that. You know, you might not think too hard about it, but you you've all seen some level of quantum. You know, things change rather dramatically when you go to quantum. And then um, when you do <coughs> Newtonian mechanics, uh, you know, you can talk about Newton's laws, but presumably most of you have gone a little bit beyond Newton, Newton's laws for non specific mechanics. And so the more sort of uh, high level frameworks in which you can do this is either using a Hamiltonian or a Lagrangian description. Um, but no matter where you start, whether it's a Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, at the end of the day, when you actually want to calculate things, you do some variational argument and you generate equations of motion. You get boundary conditions, and then, like I said, you solve them. And the solution to these equations of motion, okay, are the motion of the thing you're studying. So if you have a particle, then you're studying its position as a function of time. Let's just say it moves along an x-axis. You could say x, t, y, t, z, t if it moves in three dimensions. It doesn't matter. Okay? So this is sort of a fancy way of getting a set of equations. But once you have the equations, these are differential equations, you get some boundary conditions, you solve them, and that's going to predict the motion of your particle. And the motion of your particle is this function. It's a function of position and how it depends on time or how it evolves with time. Okay? So now, let's talk about, let's contrast this with non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay. Well, if Newtonian mechanics is valid for large decoherent systems, when is non-relativistic quantum mechanics valid? Small coherent systems. For all systems. <laughs> Well, technically, for all slow systems, <laughs> they put it in a modifier, non relativistic. Okay? But again, just like relativity, you can apply quantum mechanics to anything. Like, you can apply quantum mechanics to me. I dare you. <laughs> uh, you can apply quantum mechanics to me, and you'll get the right answer. Okay? It's just that's a lot more work than you need to do. Like, I am so big and so decoherent that this will give you the right answer. But you could get the right answer for doing quantum mechanics. So, this is a more broad, more accurate, more fundamental description, a more fundamental mechanical system or framework. Um, it's probabilistic instead of deterministic. And that's probably where you get the biggest and, and perhaps the most conceptually challenging part of going from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics is the very nature of the questions you ask and the things that you can describe changes. So instead of it being deterministic and all that follows from that, it's actually probabilistic. So if I give initial conditions, um, and dynamics, 
So I tell you what forces you're going to be applying in this quantum mechanical context, then the solution is not what's going to happen, definitely, but uh, is a probability distribution. For possible behaviors. Okay. And then in practice, when we work with quantum mechanics, and there's, again, just like with different kinds of ways of setting up classical mechanics, there's different approaches to quantum mechanics, but the one with which you're most early uh, exposed is uh, the <coughs> Schrodinger equation that tells you that the time evolution of the wave function describing the system psi is equal to the Hamiltonian operator acting on the wave function psi. So you take that evolution equation, you provide some boundary conditions, and then you solve that for the wave function of the system as a function of position and time, and then psi squared corresponds to the probability of, for example, finding the particle at a position x at some time t. Okay, so if you have to study quantum mechanics, it's okay. Um, but this is kind of roughly the sort of equation framework that you often work in in quantum mechanics. So there's sort of a parallel, right? You get some differential equations, you get boundary conditions, you solve that set of differential equations. You have a differential equation, you have boundary conditions, you solve that differential equation. The key difference, though, is what the solution represents. Here, it's literally the position of the particle as a function of time. It's the answer. Here, it's something else. It's a wave function. And what the wave function is telling you is not where it is, but it's rather telling you the probability that it's here versus here versus here versus here versus here. Okay. That being said, to connect from quantum mechanics to classical mechanics is a much hairier thing than it was to go from relativistic to non-relativistic. Like you went from relativistic to non-relativistic in that little two-minute exercise we did. If I asked you all to demonstrate how quantum mechanics reduces to classical mechanics in a two-minute exercise in the paper, could you do it? No, it's tough. You've got to kind of figure out how to rework this set of questions and answers and somehow tease out this set of questions and answers. And it's a really, it's a really challenging thing. Um, just to give you an idea, though, of <coughs> where the transition happens, with relativity, we know that slow speeds is where you can get away with classical mechanics. So when can you get away with classical mechanics as opposed to quantum mechanics? What is this thing? Superposition of a lot of small systems into a larger system. Um, yeah, but can you give me sort of a, 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 a scale? quantitative? So, so link scale is not necessarily going to do it because you have to be careful about coherence. When the action of the system is much larger than I forget what. Somebody with the action. So the action of a system, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with this, the action S is the integral for a, a non-relativistic system. It's, an, it's the integral of the Lagrangian with respect to time. That's the definition of the action. Does anybody know what the units of action are? Energy times time. And what, is, what else shares those units? H bar. Or angular momentum. Angular momentum. So, it, but, but H bar is actually the important thing here. So when the action of the system is much, much larger than H bar, then you can actually get away with using non-relative or non or classical mechanics versus quantum mechanics. Yeah, I don't totally Never mind. Sure. You can always ask me after class, too. Okay, so just, 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 just if you want, like, just a little nugget of how to go, when you can go from quantum to classical in that same sense of slow speeds, let you go from relativistic to non-relativistic, this is kind of the most sort of trustworthy thing you can say. When the action of the system in question is large compared to H bar, then you can get away with a <coughs> classical description. And, and to actually understand why that's the case, you can dig into different approaches. Like, I, I find the path integral approach to be the, the easiest way to see that. But, um, but anyway. OK, so now we can come back to the question, do we in this class really need to be doing quantum mechanics? Yes. 
Seems like. Well, <coughs> are we going to be spending small things? I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So we're, I mean, we're going to be doing some, the, the smallest things. Small, fast things. So if you have to do quantum mechanics for an atom, you sure as hell have to do quantum mechanics for a quark or an electron. Okay. So, so we need to do quantum mechanics because of what we're studying. But again, if we want to be fundamental, we want to do things with a description that's right all the time, not some of the time. So again, you know, just for that principle of trying to get the most fundamental, complete description, we should be working quantum mechanically. Okay. So... That leads us to where we naively think we should be in this class. We have established that we are going to be working with very fast things, or that we would like to be able to treat things at any speed, so we want it to be relativistic, um, but we also want to be able to describe very small things, or more fundamentally, we wouldn't be able to describe anything. So what kind of framework do you think we really need for this class? Relativistic. Relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay. All right. So that was an extremely good guess. Unfortunately, it's wrong. Um, and it's not at all obvious why it's wrong. But it's going to take a little bit of digging to figure out what's wrong with this. Okay. You're on the right track. But it turns out that when you try to take both of these generalizations simultaneously, the relativistic and the quantum mechanical, you kind of run into a pitfall, which you wouldn't have predicted going individually into those two directions. So um, to kind of unearth what this pitfall is, let's remember one of the sort of key components of quantum mechanics. So. Um, in quantum mechanics, in particular in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, what those uh, letters are going to stand for, um, we use the following expression that the integral of psi squared dx, and when I write dx, that's just a proxy for integrating over all space. Uh, if we're just looking at something that lives on one dimension, along the x-axis, I just integrate over dx. If I'm living in three dimensions, I do dx, dy, dz, or d3x. There's different ways to do it. I'm just going to use one-dimensional examples because it's simple notation. But if we integrate the square of the wave function over all space, then <coughs> this is set to what in non-relativistic quantum mechanics? One. Yeah, it's one. So in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, we normalize the wave function. <coughs> For the particle that we're describing, why do we do that? So it's not all it So you say because you can only find it once. Well, yeah, uh, you, you want to find it somewhere. Yeah, it's got to be somewhere. Like I want you to study an electron. The electron has to be somewhere in the universe. Yeah. Okay. And it, so if I, if this is the probability of finding it somewhere, and you integrate it over the whole universe, it's just saying, yep, it's in your universe. <laughs> okay. But this is actually a very important condition. Like when you're solving those differential equations for quantum mechanics. You get lots of solutions, but you get rid of all the solutions that don't have this normalization condition. Okay, and a lot of this is tied into the idea that you 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 can't write down probabilities unless you have a normalization to one, right? You know, we don't we don't have 637 percent probability of something happening. I mean, it's CU they do. <laughs> I think Trump thinks there's a 637 chance happening, but we know that that doesn't mean anything. Probabilities are things which are less than one or less than 100 percent. Okay, so if you add up all the probabilities for all possible outcomes, what should you get? About one. One, because there's some outcome. Okay, so this is tied into the very idea of there being a probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics, but this is in direct conflict with special relativity. Because one of the key things that you learn when you do special relativity, and this is something that you learned even in your modern physics class, is in special relativity, the number of particles in the universe can change. OK? 
Okay, so you should have studied in special relativity, for example, <coughs> if you take you know two particles and you smash them together with enough energy, you can actually get three particles out, or you could actually get one particle out. Okay, and I want to be very clear in case there's some lingering confusion. I am not talking about taking an electron and a proton and smashing them together and getting a hydrogen atom out. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about taking an electron and a neutrino and the other thing <laughs> and a proton, smashing all of them together and getting a neutron out. Okay? I'm not getting a balanced system out, I'm getting a genuinely different particle out. So if I do that, the number of electrons, protons, and neutrinos in the universe decreased, and the number of neutrons in the universe increased. So none of those particles are going to satisfy a normal, normalization condition like this. Okay. So what we find is that there's a, there's a conflict between a simple result that comes out of special relativity, the ability to change the number of particles in the universe, and one of the sort of key ingredients of quantum mechanics, which is we want our particle to exist in the universe somewhere, because what are we going to do if we can't even say how many particles there are to study? Because then we can't do a normalization. Okay. Yes, Spencer. But if you think of like a neutron as a compilation of a neutrino proton, it's not. That's the problem. It's not. It's not. If so, when when you say that, um, there are features of bound states. So, for example, a hydrogen atom. Uh, okay. Look, I mean, we're. we're 400 years ago, people thought the hydrogen atom was like a fundamental thing, you know. But you can bang on a hydrogen atom hard enough without breaking it up and see that it's made of a couple of things. You can't bang on a neutron hard enough and see that it's made of a proton, a neutrino, and an electron. You bang on it hard enough, what are you going to see? Boom. Quarks. <laughs> You're going to see that it's made of three things, but it's made of three quarks. So you can't think of it as a bound state, like you, like the hydrogen atom is a bound state of an electron and a proton. Okay, um, now, I won't lie, there is a way to get around this problem, and it's a really horrible way. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea of how it works, um, what we can do is we can say, well, if I wanted to study sort of the probability that a particle starting here moves to this position, then in quantum mechanics, and I'm going to be very loosey-goosey here because we're going to make this all more precise later on. In quantum mechanics, the probability associated with a particle moving from here to here, and I should really say, the only thing I know is that it started here and it ended there. I really don't know what happens in between. The probability of this happening is first of all governed largely by the particle just moving from here to here. But because of special relativity, we have to include the possibility that instead of it doing this, it might move from here to here and then break up into two things, which separate and then come together, annihilate, recreate the particle I started with, and then it moves there. And then you can just keep on making more complicated versions of this to your heart's content. And in quantum mechanics, we have to allow all possible trajectories from this point to this point. Now, if that sounds weird to you, remember the double slit experiment. The way we explain how shooting an electron through a double slit apparatus and seeing an interference pattern is to say the electron takes both paths. That is, we have to sum over all possible paths from here to here. That's all I'm doing here. I'm saying to sum over all possible paths from here to here, I include the simplest path plus the next least complicated plus that, that, that. Okay, and if you're thinking, that looks like a Feynman diagram, you don't really know what that is. We're going to learn what these are. Um, the problem with this is you can kind of set up something like this, but you really have no idea how big this is compared to this, compared to the next one. So when you do non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you can kind of make this framework happen, but there's a lot of input that you have to dump into it. Like you actually have to go and figure out what these numbers are supposed to be from, you know, experiment or whatever. 
So we would really like a framework which just naturally tells you how important is this compared to this compared to the next thing. What pictures am I allowed to include and which ones should I ignore, okay? And the correct framework that we should be using should be able to describe all of this and that is what we're going to turn to now. So, what framework do you think we really should be working with if we want to do particle physics? <laughs> exactly. What we should be working with is quantum field theory. <laughs> Which, sadly, is not a theory. Um, so quantum field theory um, is a very radical sort of revisioning of the starting point um, for how to work with things, and it's one that you have, for the most part, have never dealt with in any of your courses. We're actually looking to change that in the curriculum, but you, unfortunately, really haven't even studied classical field theory, to which we could then just say, well, quantize it, okay? Uh, but there is a whole notion of classical field theory that's a very useful uh, field of uh, physics, but, um, but this is essentially the quantum mechanical version of that. And so let me give you an idea, just sort of, of, of what quantum field theory is, and then I'll give you a couple of important advantages to working with it. So first of all, um, to go back to the notion of a particle, which is what you're more familiar with, what you can think of is that the particle moves through space and time, okay, along some path in space-time. This is also called the world line of the particle or whatever. But its path through space-time we can describe by some function x of t. So its position in space is parameterized by time. Okay. Um, if we instead want to work with a field, then what we have in mind is a slightly different picture. So space-time are a set of axes. And over that is another axis, which we call the field axis. And then the field, you can think of as more of a surface <coughs> parameterized by space and time. So the field is a function of space and time. Now, you might be saying to yourself, wow, that's like, that's so different, and it is. These pictures are radically different. But as usual, there should be some level at which we can connect quantum field theory to particle-like behavior through some correspondence argument, and there is. So if we, um, if we consider only localized small fluctuations, <coughs> of the field, then what we have is that our surface is essentially flat everywhere, so it's just sitting at zero, and then at certain points it's just a little blip. Okay. And those little blips correspond to classical particles. Or even quantum mechanical particles, to be honest. So we're just talking about the correspondence between a field and particles. Okay? If you want a visual, just think about water. Okay, water is a good field description. And you know, you look out at a lake, you know, that's obviously not like a little particle-like thing. It's a big continuous body. But if you look at a little ripple on that lake and you consider lots of little ripples, there's a certain sense in which you can imagine those are more like particles than the entire lake itself. Obviously, the lake itself is, well, actually, that's an interesting follow-up to this. We have to be really careful in that analogy because the lake, we know, is made of water molecules. And you might say, there's the particles. But that's not the connection I'm making here. These fields are not made of anything. They are fundamental, okay? And it is a small ripple in the field that actually corresponds to the thing we call the electron, or the thing we call the neutrino. How is this different from the general relativity idea of a space-time fabric? Um, 
How is it different? The thing where you have you know, a big flat space and you have. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. I, so, well, okay. so. Um, I like I, I don't like that language, but uh, to connect it to the more precise description of general relativity, what we would say is that the metric was a field. So the metric is defined over all space time, and then depending on the shape of the metric or the form that the metric takes, that corresponds to the geometry of the space time. Okay, so so general relativity was actually a field theory. The metric was a field. And the equations that we wrote down, Einstein's equations, were field equations. So it's a field theory. It's just it's not a quantum field theory. Okay. So I don't like the language of fabric of space time because people like to take stretchy sheets and bend them. That's all completely misleading. <laughs> Crap. But anyway, <laughs> you know. But, but but in the context of general relativity, the metric itself is a field. Okay. General relativity was kind of a little weird because we dealt with the metric field, but then we talked about like planets and sources as more like particles. We didn't treat them as fields. But in principle, you could do all general relativity with nothing but fields if you want. Okay. Okay. So um, just I just want this to I just want this to be clear. We're going to deal with fields, but the fields are not made of anything. There's lots of places in physics where fields are really nice approximate descriptions, like density functional theory or mean field theory or just continuous systems, you know, like fluids or whatever. But those are always made of something more granular. In this class, this is the fundamental thing. This is it. It's not made of anything. Okay? And then to get particles, you just look at small fluctuations in it. Now, there are certainly interesting alternatives to small fluctuations. Uh, but before I get to that, let's talk about a few advantages of using quantum field theory or a, really, a few really nice things that pop out of using quantum field theory. Oh, so that's not about this boss. All right, so, so some things that quantum field theory achieves. First of all, um, it gives a natural origin of identical particles. Okay, so when you study quantum mechanics, you probably had this, uh, this idea thrust upon you that all electrons are identical. Like you literally can't tell one electron from another, and you're probably really bothered by that because you're like, well, this one, I went drinking with this electron the other night, and he got trashed, and this electron was at home watching Netflix, and I know there are two different electrons. But that's not the way quantum mechanics works. The electrons are absolutely completely and totally identical, and you have to have a certain symmetry under their exchange, the same with any other particles. But with field theory, we can actually kind of see why that's the case because two electrons are just two ripples in one field. There's only one field. There's not a field for this electron and a field for this other electron. There's one electron field in the universe, and then all the electrons we see are just little ripples in that one field. Okay? So there's something really nice about sort of giving that, that identical particle observation and underpinning. Um, it gives weights to uh, uh, diagrams, that is, it naturally tells us how this factor compares to the next factor and the next factor. So we'll look at expansions like this coming out of field theory, these Feynman diagrams, and the coefficients that go in front of these various terms just pop out of quantum field theory. We don't have to actually do any more work. Um, another really nice thing that it gives us is the spin statistics theorem. Anybody know what the spin statistics theorem says? Yes. You may have heard of a boson. Yeah. You may have heard of a fermion. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Stack one on top of each other. Integer versus half integer square. Okay, so what you're saying is one's an integer, one's a half integer. Okay? But what you're actually what you don't realize you're saying is the spin statistics theorem. A boson is by definition a particle which obeys Bose statistics, which means that it's symmetric under the exchange of two particles. A fermion, by definition, is a particle which obeys Fermi-Dirac statistics. That means if you interchange two of them, the wave function has to be anti-symmetric. Everything that I just said has not a goddamn thing to do with spin. But it turns out 
it turns out that every boson has integer spin and every fermion has half integer spin. That connection is the spin statistics theorem. The statistics is Bose-Fermi, the spin is integer half integer. Okay? And that's a very non-trivial connection. To say something is a boson is just to say, if I swap two particles, it's symmetric. But to, but to associate that with it having integer spin is a very non-trivial thing that you can only get out of quantum field theory. It's certainly something that you've used before. The Pauli exclusion principle is rooted in this, okay? But its origins come from quantum field theory. And then last but not least, um, Over and above non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which couldn't do most of this, um, quantum field theory allows for non-perturbative phenomena. So what do I mean by that? Well, when I look at tiny little fluctuations, these are also called perturbations. They're tiny. But we could imagine the field doing something really crazy where the whole field kind of has like a waterfall structure. And then we look at little fluctuations in this sort of waterfall field structure. You know, so if we take a lake and then we have a little waterfall and then there's a lower lake and then we think about a little drop and it goes over the waterfall. And there's some really big changes. Those big changes in the field you can't describe just by talking about how little fluctuations behave. Those are what we call non-perturbative phenomena. And you can only handle that with quantum field theory. And it turns out the standard model has this. The Higgs mechanism is actually an example of a non-perturbative effect in quantum field theory. Okay. All right, so um, what I'm <laughs> in the negative two minutes of class left. <laughs> um, would anybody take me if I just a little bit over? Has anybody got? Has anybody got to run? Define a little bit. <laughs> Define a little bit, like eight minutes. I'm not going to pull a Gabriel on you and say, uh, okay, well, in the next eight seconds, I'm going to do this. Um, <laughs> so I want to very quickly give you kind of a, I want to give you an overview of the standard model. That's the thing we're really going to be spending most of our time studying. By the way, this is not a course in quantum field theory. I'm not going to teach you quantum field theory. We're going to get some ingredients of quantum field theory down, but we're really just going to kind of strip out results that we can use to do some calculations. To really study quantum field theory requires you to dedicate at least a year at like the graduate level. This is a very big subject. So we're just going to kind of get what we need in order to actually be able to do useful things in medical physics. So um, just very briefly, to give you an overview of the standard model, it's going to look something like this. So we'll start at the top with fundamental fields. And these are what some people like to call particles, but we know better. And we can take all of the fundamental fields in the standard model and break them up into three large categories. <coughs> the first category is what we call the force particles. These are also the mediators, or they're also the gauge bosons. These are all different words that mean the same thing, gauge bosons. And these we can break up into three different categories. The first is the one for electromagnetism, which we call the photon. Good. That's going to be represented by gamma. For the weak interactions, we have the W plus minus and the Z naught bosons. Okay. These, some of these things might not make any sense to you now. They're going to make tons of sense later on. Um, for the strong interactions, we have eight gluons. These two things together we call the electroweak interaction. <coughs> this we call QCD, quantum chromodynamics. Okay? And we'll understand what, why electroweak and then why QCD as we study these in more detail. Um, the second group of things that we break the fundamental fields down into is what I call technically stuff. And stuff is what we associate with matter. That is, this is what you're made of. Okay? And in the standard model, these are all of the fermions that appear in the standard model. So you'll notice all of these are bosons, all of these are fermions. All of these have integer spin, these have half integer spin. These things we can break up into categories which we call families. 
into the leptons and the quarks. The leptons themselves we can break up into what are called three generations. We can do the same with the quarks. And the three generations are the electron neutrino, the electron, the muon neutrino, and the muon, and the tau neutrino, and the tauon. And for the quarks, we break them up into three generations with the up and the down strings and the charm, the bottom and the top. Okay, each of these things we call a flavor. Okay, so we have 12 flavors here. Cool. What was that? <laughs> Is that the camera? I don't think so. I don't no think way. the camera can make it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. it was from the that was somebody here. saying, dude, you have got to go. Um, for all of these particles, you times this by 2 because everything has an antiparticle. So lots of fundamental fields. Note that for each and every one of these, there's a field in the standard model. For the quarks, it gets worse because you times everything by two for antiparticles, but then you also have to times by three for color. <laughs> because the quarks can come in red, green, or blue. Okay. Um, and again, all of this is stuff that you will understand in detail as we proceed through the course. Okay. So that is the that's almost the content of the standard model. There's one more of these. And if I keep talking and you got to go, just get up and make up. You're not going to offend me much. Um, we have this last category, which we call God. And this is six, which plays a very different role from the rest of these. Um, because this particle is actually responsible for uh, the masses of the rest of these. Okay. Now, these three categories you can actually specifically break up by spin, because this is spin zero. This is spin a half, and this is spin one. Okay. So this is the sort of overall field content of the standard model. But what we really want to do is we really want to break this down and see how all of these fields interact. And if we want to talk about how all fields interact, then we have to talk about some Lagrangian that's going to describe how all of these different things interact. And so I'm going to show that Lagrangian to you. Um, and probably there. Are you going to try to cover your whole body? Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? Put it on there. What's the difference? So, there's Ella Grazin. Yeah, if you want to take a couple seconds, write that down. Um, so, so, this is. So this is the standard model of Rajan. Those of you on the front row will recognize things like W plus, W minus, Z naught. You'll notice there's some phi, some H's, there's an A, there's you know, there's lots of good stuff. G's, all kinds of good stuff. We are never going to write this thing down and, and, and work with it, W or <laughs> What is obscured by this very nasty looking expression? And what I hope to impress upon you in the course of this semester is that the standard model is actually an incredibly beautiful thing. Its elegance is obscured just by the level of detail here, but the standard model itself is entirely built upon symmetry principles. The interactions in the standard model are statements about symmetries that exist in nature. Okay? The Higgs mechanism, how things get mass, is actually a statement about symmetries in nature, in particular how we break symmetries in nature. Okay? So particle physics is a very, very detailed thing. If you want to get it all down and you want to be able to do every single nitpicky calculation, there's a lot to it. And I'm not interested and I certainly can't get you there in this semester. What I'm going to aim to do is to give you an overview of the theme of the standard model, in particular the role of symmetry. Okay. Get you through some of the very elegant conclusions. For example, I want you to understand the Higgs mechanism. I think you all want to know about the Higgs mechanism since the Higgs boson was discovered. I want you to understand what the statement means that forces arise from symmetries. And then lastly, I really want you all to understand the idea of renormalization. And if 
effective theories because that's exactly where we can see that the standard model is at the end of the story. There's got to be something deeper. And in all of this, I have to say, you'll notice the very obvious absence of one interaction. Correct. Gravity. And there's a very good reason why gravity is left out of this, but in the extension of the standard model, in the complete theory, of course, gravity has to play a role. For those who took general relativity, this course is going to seem a bit different, but there's going to come a certain point, and for those of you who didn't take general relativity, this will pay off for you if you ever actually study it, where if you formulate things in just the right way, going from particle physics and forces from symmetries to general relativity looks exactly identical. And so we'll, we'll elaborate on that when we get to that point in the course. Um, but uh, in general, you know, I don't want you to be scared by that. We're never actually going to write this down and do any calculations with it. We're going to see where this kind of the ingredients arise. Okay? Um, but we've got a semester to get there. All right, so I'll see you all next time. I'm going to send you an email uh, tomorrow with some things to think about before our next meeting. Yeah, I'm going to